Okay. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Megan Sebastianski and I'm with the Alberta SPOR Unit Knowledge Translation Pro Platform. Uh, before we get started, I would like to acknowledge that although we are meeting virtually, each of us live on the traditional lands of First Nations, Métis and Inuit people whose histories, languages and cultures continue to influence and enrich our vibrant community. I'm pleased to welcome you today to this session on co-designing an evaluation tool using an adaptive virtual approach. But before we get started, just a few words of housekeeping. This session is best viewed in speaker view, not gallery view. Please keep your video camera off to ensure your privacy and to prevent interference with your audio. To access reaction buttons, such as thumbs up, click on participants at the bottom of the live stream window. You will then see the reaction icon at the bottom of the participants tab. If you have questions, please post them in the Zoom chat box. We have Amanda Wagner and Diane Aubin from the Alberta SPOR team here to help moderate your questions. If you experience technical difficulties, the best first step is to exit and then rejoin the session. You can also post questions in the chat box for technical help from our team. This session is being recorded and you can watch the recording later when it gets posted to the Whova event app and on YouTube. So I'm pleased to present our speakers today. Uh, we have Eileen Keogh, who is a senior practice consultant with the Alberta Health Services Allied Practice and Education team. Candice Ramjohn, who is a project coordinator with the Alberta SPOR Knowledge Translation Platform. Laura McAlpine, who is a Knowledge Translation Coordinator with the Alberta SPOR Knowledge Translation Platform. And Erin Fote, who is an Evaluation Specialist with the Edmonton Police Service. Okay, take it away, ladies. Okay, so thank you and good afternoon, everyone. So as Megan just mentioned, today we're going to be talking about a uh, co-design project that our team has been working on to develop a web-based interactive evaluation tool. So I'm going to start off by describing where this idea came from and what we're trying to accomplish with this project. I'll then briefly introduce you to the co-design process we're following before passing things off to my teammates. We're going to talk about the larger goals of the project, the methods we've used and the journey we've taken, and provide a quick demo of the tool before finally sharing some lessons learned. So by the end of today's session, we hope that all of you will discover how co-design and implementation science can benefit patient-oriented research, uh, be inspired to apply practical approaches to co-design and recognize potential limitations, and finally, gain an overview of what the evaluation tool can do and how evaluations can incorporate implementation outcomes. So before we get started, we would like to know a little bit about who is here with us today. So for this, we're going to use Zoom's annotate feature. And for those of you who aren't familiar with this, uh, you can access it by clicking on view options just to the right of the green bar at the top of your screen, then clicking on annotate and finally stamp. And then you can just pick one of the stamp options and click on the bubble that best describes where you come from. And feel free to click on more than one bubble if you do wear multiple hats. So we'll just give everyone a couple moments to do that. Okay, perfect. Thanks so much, everyone. Okay, so where did the idea to develop an evaluation tool originally come from? Well, for the past two years, I've worked with the Alberta SPOR support units knowledge translation platform, and we exist to help researchers and people working in the health system with knowledge translation, which is all about closing the gap between knowledge and practice. And a big focus is how to best implement research evidence that is ready into the healthcare system. So our platform receives a number of requests for implementation support, ranging from help with writing grant research proposals, all the way to helping out with initiatives already taking place in the health system. And after doing this work for a while, I started to realize a couple of things. A lot of teams out there want help with how to best evaluate implementation in the, of their initiatives. 
And when they came to our platform, their evaluations were almost always based on something called the Alberta Quality Matrix for Health. Now, this matrix is really, really important because it's designed to align with the overall aims of the health system. And it enables teams to either assess existing services or changes in health services in a standardized way that lines up with those overall aims. So it's really, really helpful. Now, it, the matrix is set up to measure certain things really well, things like patient health outcomes or health service quality, which is things like appropriateness of care for patients and accessibility of care for patients. Now, but, and this is especially important when any changes are made and how things are done in the health system, how things are implemented in the health system, the matrix is, mis is missing measures of implementation. So how those changes were made in the health system. Now, new programs or new, do, or new ways of doing things are implemented in the health system all the time, especially now and evaluating how these new programs or ways of doing things are implemented, how those changes are made is important because it can tell you why that change succeeded or failed. So if a new program worked really, really well and benefited patients by reducing hospitalization and making care more accessible to a wider group of patients, you want to know how that happened so that that program can be successfully replicated and implemented at other sites. However, if a program fails to produce any expected benefits, teams need to understand why so that they can learn from the experience and do better next time. So after a while, I started to think about the possibility of developing something that could help people doing this type of work to better assess, to better evaluate implementation, something that would bring together the ideas from the world that I work in, so knowledge translation and implementation science, which is the study of implementation in the health system and this health quality matrix. Okay, so at this point, I had an idea based on what I saw in my work. So now it was time to see if this was an actual need for people doing the work. So I had an opportunity to get this idea down on paper and I shared it with a few people who I saw as possible users for something like this. I asked if they would be interested in being part of a project to co-design something to bring these ideas together. And to my surprise, everyone I asked said yes. And because of that, we were given the green light from our platform to go ahead and get started with the project. Okay, so how are we going about this? Uh, so this slide outlines uh, the design process that we're following for this project, and this will be the main focus of the session today. Eileen and Candice are going to cover it in more detail in just a bit. Um, however, it's important to note that we decided to adopt a co-design approach to this project quite early on. And we did that because we wanted whatever was created from this process to actually be used by users, to be relevant to their work and actually be helpful to their work. And I knew I definitely wasn't the best person to do that. And then because we're using a co-design approach, it's important to note that all team members are heavily involved at each stage in this process and make decisions to help shape what each stage looks like. So not just the final product, but the overall process itself. Okay, so now what exactly is it that we're building? What is this thing? What is this tool that I keep talking about? Now we're not gonna spend a ton of time on this piece today. Candice is gonna provide a quick demo of the tool to share what we've created using the design pro process outlined on the last so slide. And as I mentioned before, we're trying to develop something that will help people think about how to evaluate implementation and build this into their Alberta quality matrix for health-based evaluations. So the dimensions of health service quality that most evaluations in the health system are based on are listed here at the top of the page. So you'll notice that this image is very well designed and the dimensions are nicely defined. And we're pulling from the field of, of implementation science to inform what implementation outcomes to include. Specifically, we're using Enola Proctor's recommended list of implementation outcomes, which are pictured here at the bottom of the slide. And they include measures of fidelity. So did you follow your plan? Did you implement what you intended to implement? Feasibility, is this actually doable for the healthcare providers that need to change their practice? And then also maintenance. So how is this actually incorporated into daily practice? 
And it's important to note that the difference between these two images really nicely represents what it's like to access information from these two fields. So the top is from quality improvement. It's clear, it's straightforward, and it comes with an accompanying guide. The bottom is from a journal article published in 2011. The article itself is a really, really good read, but you have to know where to find it, what to do with the information, and you need the time to do all that. So hopefully this web-based evaluation tool that we're building are gonna help people take a few shortcuts and start to think about how to combine these ideas in their evaluations. So we'll now go on to talk about some of the larger goals of the project and how it relates to patient-oriented research. Okay, so that's off to me. So why did we want to incorporate implementation outcomes into AHS and now, in my case, EPS, Alberta Health Quality Matrix or Health-Based Evaluations? What were our goals in developing this tool? Uh, like Laura was saying, we wanted to address a gap in implementation science. So the field of implementation science was developed to get research evidence into healthcare practice. I think we all know the challenges in improving healthcare are numerous and considerable effort is required to develop and deliver best practice. There are many interventions with evidence of effectiveness, both in health systems and patient outcomes, but the difficulty lies in implementing and using the evidence to potentially improve healthcare. This knowledge practice gap in healthcare refers to the gap between scientific evidence and the application of evidence into practice in the healthcare system. Next slide. <laughs> Thanks, Candace. So I'm going to walk through two gaps. The first gap that led to the development of implementation science and the second gap that still exists within implementation science that this tool is aiming to fill. Uh, Graham in 2006 indicated that despite the considerable resources dedicated to health sciences research, a consistent finding from the literature is that the transfer of research findings into practice is often a slow and haphazard process. CIHR describes that there's a dual challenge in the research to practice continuum. The first is that there's limited capacity to translate the results of discoveries that are generated by basic biomedical research in the lab to the bedside. And then the second challenge refers to our limited ability to synthesize, disseminate, and integrate research results more broadly into healthcare decision-making and clinical practice. So passive diffusion of research through these means into clinical practice can take many, many years. Um, and it's been found that it can take up to 17 years, uh, if it ever gets there at all, to put research evidence into practice. Um, it was first thought that implementation science was required to fill the gap of moving research evidence into practice by helping to inform implementation strategy. So the growing body of evidence for implementation then has the potential to bridge the knowledge to practice gap in healthcare. So the gap that still remains is that though implementation science has progressed ras rapidly over the past 20 years, uh, the literature and theory are growing, practical guidance and recommendations on how to actually use implementation science evidence in implementation practice is lacking. So then the next um, goal, I guess, um, thanks Candace, <laughs> is to strengthen implementation evaluation in the health system. Um, so the larger goal of this project was to develop a user-friendly tool to address this gap um, that can strengthen implementation evaluation in the health system, enabling teams and organizations to monitor and improve on how the change in practice uh, was made throughout a project. Um, proper evaluation of not only quality outcomes from the HQCA, but also implementation outcomes are important as they would reveal potential barriers and unintended impacts from the intervention and potentially reveal necessary corrections for the intervention or implementation strategy to ultimately achieve practice change. So finally, the last objective in this project was to develop a tool that would support, strengthen, and provide feasibility in evaluating initiatives that have been implemented in the health system. So thus using the knowledge from the evaluation would be able to help accomplish what the initiatives are set out to do and ultimately improve patient health outcomes. Okay, thank you so much, Erin. So we're just going to pause for a quick moment to do a quick poll with you. And we're going to do this through Menti. So please grab your phones or open up another window in your browser, go to menti.com and enter the code that you'll, you should see shortly there at the top of your screen. 
um, in order to respond to this question, which is, so thinking about what Aaron and I have described so far, have you recognized any of these gaps in evaluation and or implementation science before? The link is in the uh, chat it's for everybody's uh, convenience. Thank you so much, Diane. Uh, so we'll just give everyone uh, a few moments to respond. Oh, that's great to see. It really seems like it's resonating with uh, with people who are here with us today. That's great. Okay, so I'm now going to pass it over to my teammate Eileen, and she will continue the conversation for us. Thanks, Laura. So as we see from the poll, thanks for, for doing that. We see that lots of you have seen them. Um, uh, sorry, have seen, have found this gap in your own practice as well. So we hope that what we describe as our journey and the, the process that we went through is informative to you. So how do we go about this work of co-designing a tool? We wanted some structure to the co-design process to act as a guide, but we also wanted it to be nimble as well. We initially planned to meet in person for the kickoff, but COVID arrived and we needed to make a shift, of course, to a virtual plan. When we look at the members of the group, what we're going to talk show in just a minute, we all of the group had some knowledge of implementation, but we had also varying experiences in different practice settings. And the diversity of skills and experiences were tapped into throughout our co-design process. So when we're speaking of co-design, um, this is a definition that we, we chose that we like. It's really the act of creating a product product or program with stakeholders to ensure that the result, results are usable. And Laura spoke from the beginning of the formation of this work, how, how that was a really driving force and, and how we moved forward. So we wanted to bring the together the developers and users in a shared equal partnership. And as well as Laura mentioned, we wanted to make sure the end product was practical and usable and using those knowledge and skills that I mentioned that we each brought to the table. So the list here is the co-design team that included this balance of knowledge translation experts from Alberta SPORE and users from a few different teams within Alberta Health Services. And as Erin mentioned now, she has a new role with the police service. So we're bringing them into this um, web of our work as well. So as mentioned, we wanted to use an evidence informed process for the co-design of the evaluation tool. So we looked to the experts in instructional design. So what we came up with, and honestly, it was uh, the group at Alberta Spore after some research was using the successive approximation model or SAM for short. This design instructional design model was chosen as it's practical, collaborative, and an agile way to approach instructional design. As you can see from this image, the, the preparation phase is quite short. As well, one of the key components of SAM is a kickoff design meeting called the Savvy Start. Initially, sorry, the two slides are fairly similar. I'm like, oh yeah, we flipped already. <laughs> Initially a half day video conference meeting to allow members in the two main locations of Edmonton and Calgary to gather was planned. And the goal of that meeting was to establish a working draft of the tool, as well as outlining the learning objectives for the intended users. With COVID, as mentioned, we quickly had to adjust to 100% virtual meeting, and we ended up with two half-day sessions. The first meeting was in April, and it focused on grounding and visioning. We started with validating the gap, the goal, and the users, and then came the visioning. And a, a phrase that really resonated with me was, how might we, and dot, 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 build an evaluation tool that met the needs that we were looking for. The second Savvy Start meeting was about a month later, where we dug in and really built the tool. As you can see from the diagram here, SAM is a cyclical process. 
based on the three basic steps of build, review, design. So after the initial Savvy Start meetings, we then went on to have further meetings to continue the discussion and the development. So now I'm going to pass the microphone over to Candice, who will talk about what happened next. Okay, so as we are all aware, things changed. Uh, with the shift into an entirely virtual setting, we then needed to adapt our communication, our ideation, our methods, our prototyping, and even our testing to fit our new setting without impacting our goals or progress with the project. So this heavily influenced not just how we would move forward with the project, but even influenced the evolution of the product itself. So that is designing a web-based tool. So influenced by the new setting and work environment, we took a step back and considered what approaches to co-design in a virtual setting could we take. Given the shift to a virtual setting and limited resources, but the wealth of skills within the team, we needed to reassess our methods to proceed with the project. Difficult, uh, sorry, it's difficult to translate a savvy start into a virtual setting. Um, the inexperience uh, and lack of knowledge of working virtually would have diverted more time into the setup of adapting and continuing the savvy start. And we really wanted to use our time and resources wisely to progress. So the savvy start of diving into prototyping would have been a little too chaotic and difficult to manage. So we looked at, um, to the design thinking methodology here to guide our next steps in the process. We thought this would be ideal for us because it's a simplified user-focused process that we could integrate with our co-design approach. It's usable and doesn't require a team of design experts, yet it gave us stepping stones to work through making a user-friendly tool a reality. So based on our original co-design plan with the overlay of design thinking, we modified our planning and processes to what we thought would best fit our team. So for example, adapting the original two-day fast-paced savvy start into a half-day structured virtual fast-paced event. It really wasn't until after the savvy start was done um, that the conversation felt very incomplete and we really thought it was worth diving deeper into it. So we did consult with the team and found everyone was on board with the second savvy start to really kick up the momentum and revisit the problem and how we defined it, even with the prototypes to ensure that we were still on the right track. So everything was so fast paced, it did leave us feeling a little disoriented and we had to adapt and redo the process to really get our bearings. So our prototyping also had to be done live in a virtual setting using software that would allow us to take the design elements on the fly and move the elements around just like you would puzzle pieces. Uh, we also pulled from skill sets within the team to optimize our ideation and communication. So for example, we use graphic recording. Here's a definition of graphic recording. Uh, as you can see, graphic recording is descriptive, it's not prescriptive. And it's a really good example of a collaborative design tool that we use that worked for us. If you're not familiar with graphic recording, it's not a revolutionary new concept, but it was one at our disposal that made it easy to absorb content on a visual level for the team. And it also aligned with the creativity and high energy level that was promoted in the savvy start and prototyping phases. Here's a sample of the graphic recording that was done for the Savvy Start. As you can see, it's very organic uh, and compiles the ideas and realizes the exchange of information in a conceivable visual space. In terms of design thinking, the graphic recording method is a user-focused communication adaptation that fits into the empathize, define, ideate, and prototype phases of our process. So before I talk about the evaluation tool prototype, I'm gonna jump ahead to the usability testing phase as this was another adaptation in the project. Usability testing is about capturing the interaction between the user and the product by observing the behaviors and reactions between the two. And in this case, usability testing is being used to obtain qualitative data to improve the tool to align with our larger goals Aaron talked about earlier. Because we developed a purely web-based tool and a virtual environment became our only channel to test and promote the product, usability testing had to be modified for a virtual setting as there was no opportunity for in-person or observation-based testing. This is the phase of the project that we're currently in. 
Users have access to the website where the tool is housed and have been given surveys uh, or digital forms to action out prescribed tasks and record their responses. So now that we've gone through a roller coaster of changes and adaptations, let's have a quick look again at our co-design process, uh, which should be fairly clear now how and why our process was formulated this way. If you're curious how the design thinking overlaps with our process, uh, the set the stage aligns with the empathize phase, the savvy start um, with the define and ideate. And because we repeated the savvy start process, again, uh, it aligns with the ideate and the prototyping. And then we have a distinct prototype phase and the testing phase where we're currently at. Okay, so now the moment you've all been waiting for, uh, the evaluation tool. So I'm gonna walk you through a very quick demo to demonstrate not only what the tool can do, but to also illustrate how our co-design methods and process resulted in a tangible, usable product that will continue to evolve and improve to meet the goals of the overall project. Bear in mind, it's not a one-size-fits-all tool, so it has its merits and it has its deficiencies. It doesn't fit all models or frameworks, but it was our best attempt to marry the two together. And the two that I'm referring to are the Alberta Quality Matrix for Health and the um, Implementation Outcomes. And then do note, it's currently designed to be a guiding tool about asking the right questions. Okay, so here's the homepage or landing page for the website. Uh, this in particular will introduce users to the website and what they, the user and the tool are here for, um, including a brief history of the tool development. The about page dives into the background of the project, what we are building and the pieces that make up the construct of the tool. That is the dimensions of quality from the Alberta Quality Matrix for Health, as well as Proctor et al's implementation outcomes defined. Even on the about page, we wanted to have a little bit of um, interactivity for users as well, where they can scroll over to view the definitions of the um, dimensions of quality and implementation outcomes. The tool itself is a web-based construct that we designed to be interactive. So we didn't want it to be static like a document. Uh, we really wanted to engage users and stimulate those connections between the dimensions of quality and implementation outcomes, as well as how they can influence evaluations to promote better patient and healthcare outcomes. It's important to note here in the tool that the different qualities and outcomes are categorized into different perspectives. So you can see here patients, healthcare providers, support, organizations, as well as setting. Each quality is accompanied by sample questions and indicators to encourage the consideration of implementation outcomes into evaluations for improving health outcomes in their perspectival category. So as you can see, users can select and deselect options in an a la carte style throughout the tool and then print a hard copy of their selections for their records or for further use. And lastly, we also have a contact page and form where users can reach out to us with any questions or considerations they have about the site or the tool. So what did we learn from this entire experience so far? Well, to sum it up nicely, we learned a lot. We discovered many challenges and strengths along the way. 
uh, some of those challenges include working in a virtual setting. So there's ups and downs and hiccups of coordinating and meeting virtually, um, screen shares, information sharing, and collaborative applications. Uh, it's uncharted territory. When you think about it, we're all pioneers in this entire experience. Uh, challenges and terminology. So considering that we're all from different professional backgrounds, uh, there's different language use. So it's really learning to translate and interpret what each other's saying. And there's also competing priorities, shifting engagement and adapting to new work and personal settings and the evolution of our work during the pandemic. At the same time, there's a lot of strengths that we discovered from this. Uh, we did learn that we have a very strong team. Everyone was a champion in their roles. There was great chemistry and a perfect blend of personalities and subject matter experts. Everyone had unique skill sets. So everyone had talents and more to bring to the table than we anticipated. And this really enriched the experience in the project overall. Um, there's a flexible approach. So being malleable and open-minded and being resourceful, uh, utilizing cost-effective options, um, as well as using uh, within the available skills and resources of the team, as well as balancing voices, uh, being good listeners, having clear communication and a safe space for feedback and criticism. And really each member took away different learnings from this experience. So Aaron, for example, learned that there's new methods for co-design and a value of having a graphics or visuals designer on the team. Naomi, who unfortunately couldn't join us today, uh, learned new methods for co-design as well. I learned that there's no one size <clears throat> fits all co-design. It's really a mix and match of the methods that work best for your team and your project, as well as I gain new skills by being resourceful. Uh, Laura learned that there's new methods, uh, especially around design, that there's lots to take on, but very worth it. Uh, so for example, new skills, experience, um, the realization of her vision uh, with the project. And as Eileen mentioned, um, the how might we was a big takeaway for her in terms of how the Savvy Start was framed and how it was used to guide it. So in regards to each learning objective, we've compiled a couple points about what others can learn from this. Our first learning objective was to discover how co-design and implementation science can benefit patient-oriented research. From this experience, others can learn why implementation outcomes matter and how co-designing solutions can lead to better patient outcomes. With the objective of applying practical approaches to co-design, and recognizing potential limitations, others can learn that there are many co-design methods to choose from, and there is no right or wrong combination. And be flexible and intentional with the process and your plans, but remain intentional with your goals. And lastly, in gaining an overview of what the evaluation tool can do and how evaluations can incorporate implementation outcomes, others can learn about the products and developments such as the evaluation tool and how it can help that is to improve evaluations um, as well as improve patient-oriented outcomes. So thank you all for listening. I hope you found this informative and helpful and uh, we will now turn it over to questions and comments. Hi, it's Laura here. I see a question uh, posed by Megan in the chat and I'll just read it out for everyone. Um, so you mentioned that you were limited to online work because of COVID. So what offline processes would have been the most useful for the co-design process? So the one thing that really stands out to me and I'll let my teammates uh, chime in as well is when we were talking about that um, particularly that savvy start meeting that was used to kick off that successive approximation model process that we were hoping to follow in the beginning of the project. What you were supposed to do is kind of come together and the intention is, is that you would kind of dive right into prototyping. So, and through that conversation, mostly focused on why this prototype won't work for what we're trying to do here, you would come up with another design idea and then prototype something else. You would move through that process three times at least. 
And then, so when I trialed kind of doing that through Zoom, um, just with members of my, of the platform team, I quickly realized, and this was new to me, is that things on Zoom became so chaotic and confusing so quickly, at least to me. So I needed to kind of reorient things so that we could provide a lot more structure um, to guide the conversation and to rely to rely on making things a lot more visual for people rather than just like all of us sitting in a room or we were originally gonna connect through telehealth. So just two cameras on two conference rooms and just like write on whiteboards and just, you know, messy would have been okay. Suddenly now that we were in Zoom, messy was not okay. So we had to think through a lot of um, just what we could do to give it a lot more structure and ended up using, I think just Google slides and just guiding the conversation that way. Great, and there's another question from Diane. What is the motivation for researchers to use the tool? What is the carrot for them to evaluate implementation? Uh, so I really, really love this question. Um, and again, um, I'll let members of the team chime in if, if they have anything to, to build on. Um, but I think a lot of the motivation was around, like, especially in our early discussions, we had to try to set up something that was incredibly accessible for people, that was incredibly just easy for them to quickly use and grasp and have it be set up so that it's relatively straightforward. Are we there yet? Probably not, but we are going through usability testing as Candace spoke to, to try and tease that out a bit more and hopefully do a better job. Of, uh, of making it kind of easy and accessible for people. Um, and it's really just the gap of, again, a lot of teams coming to the platform and saying, we want to do this, but we don't know how. So rather than relying on somebody like me to kind of guide them through that process, it's just something that can help them kind of think things through on their own a little bit. So just, just a, a bit of a shortcut, not an, an ultimate solution. And then Lord, I so good, Laura, it's Eddie, and I'm wondering too if the question could be kind of taking a little bit of a different direction too mm -hmm. around not even the tool itself, but for researchers, just why is it important for researchers to evaluate implementation? I'm wondering if that's a different way, different direction to take the response. So Right. Okay. Did you want to speak to that, Eileen? Well, I was going to throw it to you, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I come from, well, I can, from my perspective, I come from the practice end. So I can tell you from the practice end, evaluating implementation is really around maintaining that success and that quality and sustainability piece. So, um, but I'm not a researcher, so I'm going to um, play the uh, role game and pass it back. <laughs> Okay, happy to take that. Okay, so sorry about that. Misunderstood the question. Uh, and I'll connect to um, kind of a piece that I covered earlier in the presentation with whether it's it's research, but for research, it's particularly important because it's set up to learn from the actual research process and make improvements based on that. So it is quite, quite a strength if you are doing research, but if you're also just carrying out um, other initiatives within the health system, it's also important too. And that comes back to really understanding why a change, a new program, a new way of doing things did or did not work. And so by considering the various implementation outcomes, things like fidelity, you know, did you do what you intended to do? Is this the program you meant to, to implement or does it look quite a bit different? Thinking through, you know, how workable this, this change is for the healthcare providers who actually have to do the work and change their practice. And then what needs to be considered to integrate this into their daily practice over the long term. So things like that, it's really important to know what you did if your program worked really, really well so that you can replicate it elsewhere and copy that implementation elsewhere. And then if your program failed, you wanna know why that happened and you wanna have a record of what you did to implement that and whatever measures you decide to include around implementation so that you can learn from that and do better next time. So I'm kind of repeating what I said in the presentation a bit, but I hope that gets at the question a little better. I can add if you want, Laura, Ooh, Aaron. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I guess I'm coming from the research side. And to me, the number one thing that I 
view as value for a researcher to implement this is if we're evidence generators, I think I've been able to see the challenge of translating evidence and actually getting it taken up into practice. So I think if we're involved in the implementation side, um, it's a critical opportunity to actually do as a public health researcher what I meant to do, which is to influence practice and, and change. Um, because too often, speaking to those gaps I was speaking to earlier, we generate the evidence and think like, here you go, like this is the guidance, this is best practice, but um, there's a lot about a controlled research setting that might not be replicated in the field. And I see that, I saw that at my time at AHS and evidence-based practice is a big movement here um, in the policing sector as well. And already I'm seeing people are looking to evidence-based practice and they're seeing it and they need to adapt it because so much of it is just not feasible. Um, so it's been a great opportunity for me to, I, I wanna take this tool and apply it to my space so that I can be prompted to look at these things and evaluations that I'm doing so we can understand how evidence can inform our practice in the best way possible. So it looks like there's another question from Megan. What are the next steps in the co-design process after the usability testing? Okay, thank you for that, Megan. So usability testing for us has just started and it will take a little while for us to progress through this. So we've kind of divided it into two phases. So for the first phase, we're really looking at does this tool actually work as intended? Are people able to interact with it? You know, does, and that could be very simple questions like, can they get it to load on their web browsers? Do all the pages load correctly? Those types of things to, to, to can they actually like look at the questions and then access um, resources that might be, um, included in uh, those questions and indicators as well. And then, so once we've done that and kind of come together as a team, we'll decide what changes need to be made um, for on the tool and the website based on all that feedback. We're then gonna move into phase two of usability testing, which will really just be kind of more focused interviews with people who could see this as um, something that would be helpful to their practice and something that could help their work. And then we'll, we'll go ahead and um, have a few of those conversations and then make changes uh, based on those conversations as well. So by the time we reach the end of that, um, SPORE is in an interesting phase right now where our funding is coming to an end at the end of March of next year. So right now the project is just planned to be carried out until then. So then we will do some dissemination of the tool. We will have it for the platform. We'll be able to, to share it widely. And then the next iteration, We'll go from the knowledge translation platform to the learning health system platform. And I think a lot of the, the people who work with the platform will work um, with Alberta Health Services quite a bit more closely. Um, so I hope that it will be able to, the project will continue on past March, but, but right now we don't know. So we're just trying to get as much as we can done um, in the time that we have right now. Great, and then there's another question from Catherine. When is this tool going to be available for people to use? Um, well, I mean, it is available right now. We are in usability testing. So if anybody wants to be a part of that, um, just a quick plug for that, it'll take about 30 to 45 minutes of your time and we'll include you moving through two Google Forms. Um, one to kind of complete a series of tasks and then the second will just be wanting to gather feedback. But uh, the website is there. You can access the website as it is now, but just being aware that we will be making changes over the next few months based on our feedback from um, usability testing. Oh, and I see that my coworker is clarifying something I said about SPORE. So yes, the funding is not ending, just the current cycle. Um, and the next cycle is beginning in March. So we're just wrapping up the projects from the first phase to prepare for the second. So this project being, being one of those. Perfect, and Catherine, thank you so much for that suggestion. 
I'll, uh, I'll follow up with, with you after the presentation, if that's okay. And there's two more, oh, sorry. There's two more questions, one from Pam. Could you post the website for the tool in the chat box? And then Stephanie Brooks asks, can you give any advice to people looking to develop web-based tools? What practical considerations should we know about? Candace, are you okay to take those? Um, all right, so any advice to people looking to develop web-based tools? Uh, I would say my biggest advice is um, patience and being flexible. Because <laughs> uh, when you think about it, um, when developing web-based tool, there's a lot of considerations to make. So uh, definitely be thoughtful about it. Um, it's not, you know, that you got to make something flashy. Um, or fancy when it comes down to it, simplest is best. Uh, even for us, uh, for example, like when we first started off with the prototyping for the tool, we were trying to make this um, really pretty looking uh, matrix uh, type tool for people to interact with. But then as we worked our way through it, we realized that there were certain limitations in just the resources, the knowledge, uh, to be able to execute that version. So we really had to step back, simplify things and come up with something that would be um, usable and easier to execute. So um, again, my advice would be keep it simple as best as you can uh, with the web-based tools because sometimes it can get pretty uh, complex. It's Eileen too and Candice, if I could add part of that too, is also having, as we did, having people who are going to use it all along the way so you don't create something beautiful and then find out it doesn't meet the needs of the people who are actually going to use it. So if I was to give one little bit of advice, I would suggest that too. Okay, so I'm just going to put it out there one last call for any questions or comments. No, okay, well, thank you everyone to our speakers and all of you who attended today. Uh, please continue to post your questions and comments for this session. Um, and the recording of this session will be available to watch in Whova and YouTube within about 24 hours. Uh, we would like your feedback for this session. Uh, if you could please click rate session button on the session page in the Wuhuva event app to open the feedback form. Uh, we invite feedback from those of you attending live today as well as those of you watching the recording of this session. At two o'clock this afternoon, uh, please join us in Wuhuva for a live Q&A session for our highlighted video abstract presentations. And on Friday, please join us in Zoom for our closing plenary panel presentation on sustaining long-term impact in patient-oriented research, how to make your research matter in the long term. Oh, that sounds interesting. Uh, so for those of you registered for the Virtual Institute, please find the Zoom link to join this closing plenary session in your email and calendar. Thanks everyone.